Good morning. Um, or good afternoon. Um, thank you for joining us wherever you are in the world. Um, my name's Sue Henny. I work at Idwal as Head of Marketing. I'm also a trustee of the Seafarer Charity ISWAN and I'm your host for today's webinar, What Makes, <clears throat> excuse me, What Makes a Happy Ship. Before we get started, I'll just go through some admin. Um, first of all, can I ask that you all remain muted throughout the webinar? And secondly, we welcome as many questions as you have. So please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Um, we'll aim to include as many questions as possible during the session. But if we run short of time, um, we'll make sure we get all the questions answered afterwards and we'll distribute them to you by email. OK, so moving on to formal proceedings, um, joining me on the panel today are Eve Vandenborn. Um, Eve has been Director of Loss Prevention at the Standard p &I Club since 2013. He's a Master Mariner and has extensive senior experience um, in LNG, LPG tankers specifically, um, normally based in Singapore, but joining us today from London. Great to have you here, Eve. Thank you. Um, so. Also with us is Stephen Jones. Hi. Hiya. Stephen has also spent several years at sea, mainly on cable ships as a deck officer, and now has a successful and very varied maritime career ashore. So we know him as many things, um, but we know him best today as the founder of Seafarers Happiness Index, which he manages on behalf of the Mission to Seafarers. And last but not least, recent award winner, Tom Herbert, who is Senior Marine Surveyor at IDWAL. Um, Tom started at IDWAL in 2019, following seven years at sea, where he worked as a navigation officer on a wide variety of ships, including oil and gas tankers and also cruise ships. Um, thank you all for taking part today. Uh, really grateful to have you here and to benefit from your expertise and your insight. So thank you. Um, OK, so let's get things going with a bit of an icebreaker question. Um, all of you are former seafarers yourselves, some more recent than others. Um, what did you enjoy most about your time at sea? And do you think that those things are still applicable today? And that one's going to Tom first as our most recent seafarer. So over to you, Tom. Uh, morning, everyone. Thanks, Sue. So I think for me, it has to be the unique experiences uh, that I had while I was at sea. So seeing the stars at night, seeing the galaxies when I'm conducting celestial navigation, seeing the marine wildlife, that I've seen whales, dolphins, turtles, everything you can imagine that is at sea, I've seen. Um, and also traveling to unique locations. Um, I've been all around West Africa, all through Venezuela, which aren't common holiday destinations. But for me, it would have to be the people that I meet in general. I can still remember some of the jokes and laughs that I had on board certain vessels, though none would be appropriate for this forum. It was a very nice and enjoyable experience. And I would say, yes, these still apply. But unfortunately, these are the exception rather than the rule. The day-to-day -day life of a seafarer is 10 to 12 hour working days, seven days a week for three, four, five, six months at a time. And that is the rule. Okay, brilliant. Um, okay, so over to you, Stephen. Uh, yeah, thank you. Good to see you all. And um, did I enjoy it? I'm not entirely sure I always did. It, it, it often felt like a really strange thing to do. 
to uh, go up a gangway and then not really go off it again for a couple of months. But um, I think what I do reflect back on, I think it's very similar to the things that Tom was saying. You know, those that the experiences, the life skills, the, the the things like those professional arts that we learned of navigation, understanding the stars, etc., and and the people that we met. I think the probably the biggest thing that I took from it is the things that I've done subsequent to every bit of my career has been based upon those kind of, you know, experiences, the lessons learned, the things that people taught me at sea. And they're the things that have given me subsequently a career and everything that's moved forward. So there were lots of times I maybe didn't enjoy it so much, but equally everything I've done subsequently has been based on what it has given me. So, okay, brilliant. Thank you. And over to you, Eve. Hi, thanks, Sue. Hi, everyone. Um, not easy to come last on this question and try and say <laughs> something that hasn't been said yet. I stopped sailing in 2003, so it's it's been close to 20 years that I've been ashore, and i probably forgotten all the bad things um, <laughs> about all the, the, the shipping and all the cleaning of uh, ballast things and cargo things and everything that I've done. I've probably forgotten most of it. So the things that I remember more about, about the fun things are similar I, I really enjoyed being out at sea and in the middle of nowhere looking at the stars at night um mm -hmm. i really enjoyed uh, traveling all over the world meeting people in different locations i enjoyed working together with the people on board the camaraderie that you that you form on board of the ships having your your barbecues at uh, on the poop deck and i know on a gas tanker these days they don't do that mm -hmm. anymore but we were fine doing so um <laughs> all these fun things and then what what Stephen was saying you you build up such a wide variety of skills on board that you then build on further when you when you go ashore and i would never be able to do the job that i have today if i had not uh, been to sea okay brilliant thank you great, great stories and you know some of those things that we don't think about if we haven't been at sea like the wildlife you know fantastic um OK, so um, now to get a bit of an overview on how things currently are at sea. Um, so, Stephen, coming to you, um, in terms of the Seafarers Happiness Index, um, what are you hearing from seafarers as their kind of most per persistent concerns this year? And where are we perhaps seeing some improvements? Yeah, thanks. So the Seafarers Happiness Index, for those of you who don't know, is, is basically a kind of survey of sentiments that we run throughout the year and every quarter we report back on what seafarers tell us about a range of kind of core issues across 10 questions we ask the global seafaring population. I think through the past couple of years obviously the COVID impact has been immense and, and we've turned them the yo-yo years because what we were seeing is very much that kind of bouncing peaks and troughs across the sentiment um, as it looked like COVID was going to hit really hard, then there was obviously a falling away. When things seemed as if they were recovering, then the sentiment would rise as well. And, and we, we spotted this trend about three or four different times when it looked like it was getting better, then it got worse, et cetera, et cetera. So really, it was very much a kind of emotional roller coaster, really, for seafarers. I think in the past, two quarters that we've reported through 2022 the biggest thing is to say is that there have been improvements in the sentiment which is great to see and really very welcome because we'd been down at the lowest kind of levels that we'd ever experienced or seen so there's been definite improvements um quarter two <clears throat> we were looking at really micro level improvements they were actually on the vessels themselves where seafarers were telling us there was a sense that owners were investing more on their life at sea yeah. small things like you know improvements in gym equipment or tv audio access maybe to connectivity um small things like coffee machines seem to be one that's often mentioned as being really important and something that perhaps allows people to come together a little bit more of a focal point so so we heard those micro trends and then the last quarter report that we had, it was really about an improvement in the wider picture. Things like shore leave was starting to open up again in some places. 
And equally, there seems to be a lot more reassurance and confidence in when people were going to be able to pay off and actually go home. So, so those really were the biggest trends across the year. Um, it'll be interesting to see what the next quarter holds, and I, I wouldn't even like to extrapolate on what it might be. Could be that we've reached a high water mark. I, I worry that there are talks, you know, out in China again of continuing problems with COVID, shore leave, access to crew changes, etc. So I really don't know, but it's been good to see that when companies invest, that is reflected in the mood and it does lead to improvements. Okay, great. Thanks for that overview. Um, and now just to bring you in, Eve, um, and maybe look at some crew issues from the perspective of the Standard Club. So in the last webinar, um, we had back in um, June, I think it was, you mentioned that there's no mechanism to attribute claims to seafarer wellbeing, but that you are seeing more mental illness related um, claims. So we didn't really get much chance to go into that last time. Could you possibly expand on that a little bit, perhaps? Sure. So what, what I mean is that in, in the way that we categorize claims within the club, um, we tend to put claims on, on whether it was an injury or an illness, and then we'll, we'll look at uh, what kind of injury it was and, or what kind of illness it is. But we tend not to go much further or deeper than, than that. So as such, we don't have a category specifically to mental illness-related claims. Yeah. And in that sense, we don't always know whether a claim is, is um, if, if there is an underlying reason to the claim. Now, what I'm what I'm thinking also is that um, previously, a number of years ago, pre-COVID, etc., there was not a, that much focus on man, mental illness claims. So it was just simply categorized as an illness or an injury for us, and we didn't know any better. Now, with the focus that there is on on mental illness or well-being, rather. Um, we tend to see more of an explanation if we go through a doctor's report for somebody that is signing off, we'll get a reference to a mental well-being there. So we tend to, to see the, the word come up a lot more. It doesn't mean that we necessarily have more claims related to mental yeah. illness, okay. but definitely that we are seeing the... Um, it, the category comes up a bit more. We, we had... Um, an, 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 uh, seafarer a couple of months ago who went ashore during during a on shore leave he got totally smashed ashore uh, i mean drunk and then he started creating troubles uh when he was was coming back on board he had to be restrained he had to be um disembarked and, and a crew change had to be done so the ship was delayed we b and i got involved etc i think a number of years ago that would just simply have been categorized as a crew claim uh, because we had to repatriate um, the 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 person, but now we know more, and we don't necessarily see the report of what actually happened to this person. Why did he actually go totally mental on on the shore side? There must be an underlying reason, which I'm sure that our ship owners are looking further into. We don't necessarily see those uh, investigation reports from our side. Okay, so you you couldn't really um, comment on kind of whether there's triggers or catalysts on board. You, you're not seeing that much information, I guess. It's it's difficult, I think, to to really point at something on on the the ship that can be a catalyst. I think we all know we all more or less suspect what is at the cause. We know the social part, we know the Wi-Fi part, we know the long contracts, et cetera, et cetera. But I don't necessarily have any direct data from our side, which I think um, other companies like the mission uh, with, with the happiness index or the various helplines that the charities are doing, they get more detail. And I know Edwell is, is having their own data as well. So that will give more clarity on these issues. Okay, brilliant. Well, that brings me nicely to Tom. <laughs> um, so Edwell are now collecting data, as you've just uh, referenced, um, on crew welfare um, as part of its standard um, vessel inspection process. So again, we, we touched on it briefly in our last webinar in June, but we didn't really have um, 
kind of enough insight and, and enough data on it then. So can you give us a little bit more insight now on what that data is showing us? Yeah, of course. Thank you, Sue. Let me just share my screen initially so we can see some of the slides. There we are. That should come through now. Yeah, all good. Perfect. So as mentioned, in May of this year, we introduced 12 objective-based questions to further investigate the crew welfare conditions on board vessels. These questions were all designed to be practical in nature and aimed to highlight issues that can be resolved. Now, I'm sure everyone is fully aware, but just to recap, why is this an important topic? We are looking to improve the, the welfare conditions of the individuals running and maintaining multi-million dollar assets that are ultimately responsible for approximately 90% of the world trade. It really is as simple as that. The first slide that we have here shows the ADVOL grade on the y-axis and the welfare grade on the x-axis. This is based on vessel inspections conducted between mid-May and the 1st of December of this year. As you can see, the crew welfare is broken down into 10 point segments, with 20 being the lowest score and 100 being the highest. As the crew welfare grade is increasing, so too is the idle grade and vice versa. There appears to be some form of trend or correlation between the condition of the vessel, as indicated by the idle grade, and the welfare conditions on board. In order to investigate this further, I would first like to give you some more information on the grading algorithm itself. So the Edwell grading algorithm is made up of 21 subsections that are each appropriately weighted. For example, the engine room and cargo holds or tanks are higher weighted for obvious reasons. Crew welfare is one of the lowest weighted items. This is important as it means the correlation that we are seeing is not because the welfare grade is pulling up or dragging down the Edwell grade. The grading for the crew welfare itself is, has also been carefully designed and calibrated internally to ensure the algorithm is objective and fair. I will now look to show you several other slides as we delve deeper into the data to see if this trend continues or if other factors can explain it. The data is now broken down into four generic vessel types, bulkers, tankers, containers, and other, which comprises of row row vessels, offshore, cruise ships, basically any other vessel type that we've inspected that isn't categorized under the three other areas. As you can see, the trend between the idle grade and as such the vessel condition and potential risk and crew welfare is still present. This is particularly noticeable for bulk carriers where there is a clear increase at every stage, but the trend is noted for all. The next slide shows a further breakdown into more specific vessel types. So at random, we've chosen SR tankers, mini bulk carriers and supermax bulk carriers. And again, you can see this trend is present at each um, stage. We can see that vessel type is not having an impact, but are other factors. In this slide, we have taken three classification societies to see if they have an impact on this trend. At random, we've chosen Lloyd Register, Class NK, and DNV. It should be noted that we're using the class societies uh, to only further highlight this trend, and it is in no way a reflection upon them. Again, you can see this has no impact with the trend still being present. There is a correlation between the welfare grade and the Edwell grade. Finally, we have taken three vessel flags to see if they have an impact. Again, at random, we've chosen Panama, China, and Singapore. As with the last slides, these are only used to further highlight this trend, and it is in no way a reflection upon these flags. And again, we are seeing this is not having an impact with the trend still being present with each stage. Ultimately, this data shows that a correlation is present between the Edwell grade and as such the vessel condition and the crew welfare conditions on board. And when we view a vessel as an asset, as many of you do, this is a potential risk. The question can be asked as to whether or not condition impacts welfare or if welfare impacts condition. While this data set cannot give this answer, ultimately the resolution for either point is the same. If poor welfare leads to poor condition, then by improving welfare, you improve condition. If poor condition leads to poor welfare, by improving welfare, this will in turn also improve the condition. Thank you. Okay, brilliant. Thanks for that, Tom. Um, I mean, fascinating insight and maybe an aspect of good crew conditions that hasn't really had much focus before. So thanks for sharing that. 
Um, Stephen and Eve, have you got any comments to that? Anything you'd like to add? Stephen? Yeah, sure. Uh, I mean, no one likes people who are smug, but it's <laughs> wonderful to see that the kind of the thesis that underpinned the very existence of the Seafarers Happiness Index has kind of fallen through, fallen, followed through. And I think, you know, that's why it's been so great working with yourselves at Idwall to kind of get this data out there to start to look at those kind of issues and the canary in the cage always felt to me to be the sentiment that if seafarers were happy then it suggested that their welfare was better and now it suggests that if their welfare is better then the ships are better as well so all of a sudden we are seeing this clear kind of you know building relationship that goes through and obviously there is the chicken and the egg kind of question to it but ultimately it doesn't really matter which comes first the fact is that the equation is balanced if you have good welfare then it seems to be you have good ships if you have good ships it seems you have good welfare so i think it really is that you know finally we're seeing that not only is there this imperative to look after seafarer welfare there's also that from the financial perspective i spoke at an event um, a few months back and I kind of joked that saying, you know, having se good seafarer welfare meant that you went to heaven, but now it proves that you can also go to the bank as well because there's value in this. So uh, I think it's fantastic to see. Okay, Eve, think, have you got any comments? Yeah, I, I, I think it's really interesting to see the data that it actually does support what, what we all believe to be true. And what, what Stephen is saying, I, I, I really do agree that there is a correlation between having a happy crew and it's it's the same when when we look at our own jobs if if we are happy to do our our job we will do a better job of it if we are not happy well we'll drag our feet to the office and it's the same on a ship and and i would expand that to the safety of the ship it's not just the well-being or the maintenance or the condition of the ship but if you are having a happy crew um they will look out for each other uh, they will make sure that other people are not going to take a risk that is that is too risky or unnecessary. It it may, of course, we don't have the data, but I would suspect it will affect um, the risk of having a casualty on the ship. Yeah. Okay. Thanks for that, everyone. Um, and thanks, Tom, for the slides. Um, okay. So we've heard a bit about the concerns around crew well-being, but what do we think needs to be done? So coming to you again, Stephen. Um, from the crew responses with the happiness index, what would you say is key to making seafarers happy or happier? Yeah, I, I mean, it's happy or happiness or happier, etc. It sometimes feels a little bit of a trite word, a, a bit of a throwaway concept, etc. And hopefully, as these data is starting to show, it's not. And and really. I always felt that when we were starting to, to build the, even the concept of the happiness index, that asking someone whether they are happy seemed to be an absolutely fundamental reflection of what was going on everywhere else. And it really was something that kind of cut through to the core of how people felt about things. I think the biggest thing that comes across in asking seafarers, you know, are you happy about whatever facet is that we you know we, we can't always expect it to be a, a ship that's swathed in fixed grins and smiles and everything these these things it's, it's not necessarily about a raft of goings on and, and and everything that maybe gives a positive impression it's really about the fact that people feel confident positive relaxed they feel reassured about the goings on around them, whether that's investment from the company, whether that's the training that they're given, whether it's, as, as Eve says, you know, whether it's the support around them on board to make life better. So, you know, it's all these small things that build. It's knowing that when they finish work, they can get in touch with home. When they finish work, they can have some good food to eat and they can sleep in a comfortable bed and hopefully get a good sleep because they're not so stressed and fatigued, et cetera. They can chill out with people on board and, and have that sense of community on board and that they can go home on time when they expect to, that they receive the money in the bank when they expect to and that their families feel looked after and cared for. These are all the building blocks of what make a happy ship, because if you strip any of those away, then it's a pack of cards that falls away and you can't be happy if you're worried, stressed, upset or scared about all these other facets. 
Okay, thank you. Well, that, I mean, that was quite a comprehensive answer, but um, Eve, have you got anything you'd like to add to that? What is the secret of a happy ship? Beer and barbecue ribs? <laughs> <laughs> um, it's, it's not an easy one. And I think Stephen really did a good job answering. It's really a combination of so many different factors. And, and it could be one single individual on board or, or a circumstance that just spoils it for everyone else. And when, when you think about it, okay, the food, the recreation, the workload, the shore leave, all of those things are there. And I, I wouldn't anymore say, okay, Wi-Fi is, is the secret to it. Um, I think Wi-Fi nowadays is, is it's a given. It, it shouldn't be any more. I know the, the, the Happiness Index is still showing that there are issues with it, but I don't think that is the secret to it anymore. I would focus, if I need to think about a single item that would make a ship happy, is... Um, knowing that you can go home at the end of your contract. I, I think that that out of all the various factors can be the bigger factor at the moment. Okay, thank you. Tom? I would um, fully agree with what you and Stephen have said there. Um, I think for me, from my own personal experience, it kind of comes down to two major items um, that have kind of already been touched upon. Um, the first one's communication, and both of that is within the vessel and the ability to communicate outside the vessel. So I think it's vital that crew have a form of communication with friends and family. As we all know, instant access has become a cornerstone of our society. Uh, and I don't think it's fair that this should be omitted or potentially financially unattainable for seafarers. And while, as Eva uh, said, like there is evidence this is going in the right direction, mm -hmm. there is definite room that it can be improved upon. Um, I would also say it's very important to have a positive communication system on board. This both for the efficient running of the vessel, but also for general welfare. It is nice to be able to chat with your colleagues about um, just general life. It, make, it, it, it can take you out of that work environment if only for 20, 15 minutes, and it makes a huge difference. The second one for me is food, which is vital, and that's probably quite personal. But having personally worked on a vessel <laughs> with very poor food standards, I can testify that it had a significant impact on your happiness. After a long day's work, a good meal can and does make all the difference to how you feel. And conversely, a poor quality meal can just allow all those negative aspects of the day to be further highlighted, and it builds and it builds, and that's how you become unhappy. Okay, brilliant. Thank you for that. Um, so you've all kind of touched on um, community on board as well as kind of being in contact um, with with friends and family at home. Um, so just forgive me for being a little self-indulgent <laughs> for the moment, but as a trustee of Ice One, um, I think it's only fair that I mention their latest research around social interaction on board and the practical guidelines that they um, recently published. So my question is, do you think that modern seafaring is geared up at the moment to enable uh, social interaction on board? Um, and that one to Stephen first. Um, yeah, I mean, sadly, I, I think that, you know, social interactions or the quality of experience at life, of life at sea are, are in no way at the heart of what the mechanisms to, to create that are we, we've kind of stripped away we see fewer people on board ships we're obviously you know quicker turnarounds in port then we've had the impact of shore leave through COVID but before before COVID even you know the concept of taking time away from the vessel had kind of become a little bit of an old-fashioned hangover um, we, we've seen that some of these the facets of life on board that have changed and probably had to change, the likes of the ship bar, etc. In in some cultures, they just haven't really fully been replaced. You know, it's okay to understand the reasons why we would take something away or change or evolve, but if you're not replacing with anything, then then it makes it ever harder. And and I think the you know the the, the social interaction matters work that Ice One does is hugely important, and I think setting not only the the ideas for what people can do out is great, but having the debate and forcing that onto the agenda is wonderful as well. But I do worry that sometimes, you know, we, we can, there's a danger that it becomes fun by numbers. This is what you should be doing. It's Tuesday, so it's ballroom dancing. You know, and, and that's a, such a difficult thing. And the, and the danger is, as we've seen in everything that the shipping industry ever touches, if they can make a procedure or a management system out of it, we will. And then we have to start auditing whether you, you know, 
well, what songs did you sing at karaoke? You know, this is unfortunately the kind of the, the terrible kind of chain that we always seem to, to back ourselves into. So I think it needs to be about choice. It needs to be about the options and, and hopefully the fact that we, we put the social well-being back at the front and foremost of what we consider that seafarers want, need and should be given. OK, thank you for that. Um, Eve, would you... Like yeah, um, I, I I was thinking about about a generational difference in the sense that we keep or when I talk about socializing on board, we didn't have Wi-Fi, we didn't have anything of it. So for us, we just went to the bar at the end of the day. We had a beer before we went for dinner together and we watched the movie together because we couldn't watch one in our cabins and we were socializing that way. But the problem I feel with that is we can't keep looking at what the ships these days are doing based on our own experience from 20 years ago. It's a different generation. It's a different expectation from the seafarer. And I think I would turn it around and I would say, um, I mean, I do agree with what Stephen was saying, but I would, I would say, go and listen to what your seafarer wants. Go and ask them, what is it? How do you want to socialize? But at the same time, try and explain to them the importance, like what came out of the study that this one did. Explain to them the importance of socializing, of how it will improve the, the, the happiness, et cetera, the well-being on board. But listen to them how they want to, to do so. Okay. Thank you. Tom? Yeah, I think I agree um, with all aspects that have been raised so far from Eve and Stephen. <clears throat> I think, being honest, my answer for this was that in general, the shipping isn't ready for it and it's not ready for it just now. As um, Steve kind of highlighted on, that people who own and run ships, they're in it to make money. It's a business. Items like fuel, stores, provisions, and ultimately crew and their relevant welfare facilities are viewed as an expense. As with any business, you want to keep the expense as low as possible to maximize profits. And that might sound harsh or cold, but that is the reality of the industry that we work in. However, the data that I've shown today shows that there is a clear trend between the vessel condition and as such potential risk and the welfare condition on board. Uh, and as a result, this can lead to the potential risk to the pro profitability of the asset. So by viewing it in a different light, it makes it easier to understand the importance of welfare on board and as such enabling social interaction on board. And I think it's only by gathering and using data such as this that informed and accurate decisions can be made to ensure that modern seafaring can be as well equipped as possible to enable so social interaction on board and ultimately improve crew welfare. Okay, thanks for that. And, and so we've talked a little bit <clears throat> about um, obviously how life is on board and how that um, is maybe sometimes kind of led by decisions that are made ashore so how important do you think it is that shore-based staff are educated in onboard procedure and responsibilities so to Eve first I think you've touched on it a little bit already but I, I, I've mentioned this in, in various forums yeah. I think it is incredibly important yeah. and I think we we way too often uh, or too frequently we see evidence that that the shore side does not always understand what life on board actually is persons on that work in the operation departments of shipping companies do not necessarily have shipping experience yeah. they do not know the pressure that a captain is under or that an engineer is under when they are exiting uh, from a port then but no the moment that that an agent says uh, that the ship has left the bird they start chasing the master for a departure email and um, similarly we see the shore side sending um, questionnaires to the ship. Oh, can you please fill in this Q88? Can you please fill in this or that uh, questionnaire? When actually all of that information or three quarter of that information is available on the shore side. Yeah. So why do they then burden the master with it? I think that's another big aspect that of that workload that that affects the happiness on board. So I think it really is important that, that the shore side gets educated on, on what life on board actually is. And if possible at all, and, and I know some companies actually do so, send the operational people on, on board of a ship. Let them do a short trip. Brilliant. Yeah. Okay. And to you, um, Stephen? Yeah, I, I think uh, there's nothing that can't be made worse and certainly nothing that can't be made worse 
by being pestered, badgered, and you know all the rest of it. And that's what we seem to see too often. Um, a couple of quarters ago, it, it really seemed to come to the fore from seafarers talking about their concerns about lack of management. It seemed to translate into lack of management experience of the sea, but it was certainly a lack of empathy about being at sea. You know, the constant, oh, emails for this, all the rest of it. And, you know, it got me thinking of whenever you've been on a bus and there's a sign that says, do not distract the driver. Maybe we need that on ships, emails or sat phones because, you know, that's that's what's happening. And I think where you get that, you get a breakdown in relationships. And when you get a breakdown in relationships and trust and respect, then it's very hard to build back. So this is what we're seeing. This is a kind of, you know, another kind of canary in the cage, if you like, of where problems exist. So where you have a management team ashore that just blithely ask for what they want because they think that their needs are more important than those of the seafarer, then that will be a company that will run into problems down the line because they haven't got that quid pro quo relationship with the crews themselves. Okay, thank you. And Tom? Yeah, um Again, I fully agree with the sentiments that have been said here. I think it's vital. I think the only way they can really, the shoreside staff can really begin to understand life on board a vessel is in lieu of going on board, is having some sort of education on the procedures and the awareness of the actual responsibilities that are on the shoulders of uh, seafarers on a day-to-day -day basis. And we all know it's not a nine-to-five, Monday-to-Friday job. And seafarers never really switch off when on board. Even on their leave, I know personally, you'll be thinking of your next port of call. You've got work to do. You've got this. It's always in your head, and that's the nature of the beast that you sign up for. But I think, as Stephen hinted on, this education would allow for a more empathetic connection. So suddenly, um, the request from the crew for maybe I don't know better quality food or new gym equipment or whatever it is doesn't sound like a complaining seafarer which is a term that I, I have heard used um, from shoreside staff and I think by doing this it kind of bridges the gap between the two because again I've been in situations where it has been an almost an us v them and it shouldn't be we're all working towards the same goal and if you can bridge that gap it can make the whole process a lot smoother. Okay. Brilliant, thank you. And what, one of the questions we've had in, which I think I know the answer to this before I ask you is, do we have enough former seafarers working ashore? Um, Tom? <laughs> um, you can always have more seafarers working ashore. I think <laughs> as been hinted, or well not hinted, stated at the start by Eve and Stephen, the experiences that you learn at sea, you will only ever learn working at sea. And you have a unique skill set that allows you to go on to do very interesting and varied roles uh, I like personally for myself if you asked me three years ago when I signed off my ship for the last time if I'd be here today I would not have said yes because I, I couldn't have foreseen it but the avenues you have are there and I definitely think there's always opportunities for experienced and well-trained seafarers to bring more to the, to the shoreside roles okay anyone else want to add to that um I mean the answer is that we're, you know, we're struggling to get seafarers onto ships. And then when you're struggling to get seafarers onto ships, it's even harder than, you know, the knock on effects of what you're honestly left with down the line means that, you know, upstream, we, we are having fewer seafarers working ashore. And that means that all those lessons, the empathy we talked about, the experience, et cetera, the corporate kind of approach isn't necessarily flavored by seafarers. Um, I, I was just looking before at, um, and these are only UK figures, but I think they, they give a, a, a fair reflection that apparently there's 35,000 um, certificates of competency to work on UK vessels, and there's 265,000 UK maritime jobs. So somewhere between that, there seems to be quite a shortfall in the reality of, you know, what seafarers do or how they can fill in those gaps in the industry they, they just can't but that's why it's so important as tom said the issue of education of, of trying to make sure that we translate that we harness these things um you know we also have the issue of a very aging demographic we're losing such a lot of experience and there doesn't really seem to be the mechanisms to capture, to, to harness that, to make sure that we don't just allow all the experience to evaporate out of the industry. So, so there's a few problems 
that we need to be thinking of as we move ahead. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, so one of the questions that we've had in from um, the audience is, um, when we talk about social life, communication, chatting with friends, et cetera, do you think that not having women on board um, is something that gives impact to the social climate on board? So, you know, what, what are your views around women on board? And I guess the, the bigger question of why are we still struggling to get women on board? You know, one impacts the other perhaps, but... Um, Eve, if I come to you first on that one. Yeah, it's a difficult one. I, I think I think people on on that are in, in secondary schools or, or that need to decide on, on what are they gonna do in life um don't have the correct picture of, of what seafaring actually is. I think there is an issue that that the shipping needs to work on the image uh it has. And I I would I totally agree and accept that there are problems at the moment for female um, or not just female, but the whole DNI range um, on board of ships. There still are problems. But I also think it is it is a perception issue that uh, young kids have when they when they think about going to sea or not. So I think there is something that we that we need to work on to make sure that that people have the correct idea about what life on, on at sea can be. Okay, um, Stephen? Yeah, I mean, I've always been slightly distrusting of organisations, etc., that don't have a kind of mixed gender. So whether it's, you know, boys or girls only schools or gentlemen's clubs or whatever, it seems that they can't ever reflect the realities of what social life is like elsewhere. So to me, yes, it always, has always been that kind of missing part of the social kind of jigsaw really the fact that you're you know forcing one group to be together so a very male dominated environment now as we said there were the mechanisms there was the bar there was the whatever but now we, 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 we're taking away what that kind of entailed or gave and and now it's kind of blithely going along and carrying on the way we were and I think there's a massive important role to try and balance that social interaction on board and I think you know having female seafarers come into the industry to be enticed to be persuaded that it is a great career option that it is something to do and I think Eve's touched on it there you know the the, the way we project the image of shipping needs to change and if we can't change the image of shipping because the reality is bad then we have to change the reality yeah. okay thank you for that um, okay, another question that's come in is, um, there are good companies who provide decent conditions, but don't. Do we have any insight into what the balance is of good companies versus bad? A, a broad, <laughs> difficult question. Um, Tom, from the insights, I mean, we shouldn't name names, of course. No, but, um, I think from the... From, from from the insight of the data that we have we've been that I've been looking through no I, I when I first sat down to kind of develop these questions and implement this um I made a very kind of clear point written down first thing is it has to be objective and it is not a name and shame process if you start to name and shame companies and say company x is bad company y is amazing it can yes there is potential to have benefits but the negatives outweigh them and um, suddenly people think, oh, I don't want to look at this data or I don't want to look at this. It's objective, it's clear, and it's providing information that overall it has to improve. And yes, I'm sure there are companies out there that could improve. And yes, I know there are companies out there that are, that are trying to go above and beyond. But we don't, we want to improve it for the industry as a whole, not just individual companies, but I, we want everyone to move in the same step, in the same direction at the same time. So it's not just about improvement, it's about meeting minimum requirements. Okay, great. Uh, anybody else want to say anything on that or I'll move on to the next question? Uh, yeah, I mean, from the happiness, Seafarers Happiness Index perspective, we actually work with a number of companies who have their own bespoke surveys done to benchmark them against the kind of wider populace, etc. Um, and, and they don't want 
the coverage and they don't want publicity for doing that. But what they do is they plug into the mechanism to find out how they're doing and they honestly reflect on those things. And that's really great to see. I think the, the tragedy for all of us is that we, we care about these things, that we work hard, we're trying to bring about change, but we always tend to be in equal, equally positive fora it's always the good companies that care that we're surrounded by and we all end up kind of you know nodding along and and because we we are trying our best to improve things and unfortunately there is a massively kind of you know darker level across the industry that isn't doing anything that doesn't care that doesn't invest that just rips seafarers off for fees to go and join ships or, or abandons them or all these other things. And, and so that's the, the real change that I think we have to bring about. We have to somehow bring the lower, lesser lights of the industry around the table somehow. I don't know how you do that because it's not compelled. They don't have to, you know, they have to comply with legislation, but even then there seems to be ways and means of not perhaps so much doing that. So this is what we're left with, you know, and I guess, we're pulling the good companies even further away from that horrible, terrible morass that we need to get into. The likes that the Mission to Seafarers chaplains see that when the visitor volunteers go and visit, you know, the bad ships that aren't looking after seafarers. Okay, thanks for that. Lots of food for thought, maybe. And Eve? So if I if I can just add on, and I, I do agree with what, what Stephen and Tom were, were saying. And if I look at things from from a PNI perspective, I tend to only see bad things because that's what we exist for. Um, so I see all the negative things that are happening. And similarly, when when we are looking at all these, um, I'm, I'm not talking the Edwell data because that goes across a wider spectrum. But if we are looking at at um, helplines, if we are looking at the happiness index, it tend to be the people who are not always happy that want to voice it out and that want to complain. So yes, it is important. Yes, we need to listen to those people and try and, and make changes. But let's not forget that the vast majority of ships are still sailing happily. Well, maybe not happily, that's the wrong word choice, <laughs> but they are still sailing um, and are reaching their destination with, with intact cargo. Yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you. So we've got quite a lot of questions that have come through and we've not got much time left, but I'll just try and cover um, a couple. Um, so we've had a question in, um, really a point about, um, I think, possibly a seafarer. Um, certainly agree that being able to go home um, is essential for a happy ship, um, but restrictions imposed by port authorities and company lack of empathy makes it impossible to achieve. How can this situation improve? Um, often shipmaster recommendations to sign off are ignored by companies. Um, Stephen, do you want to make a comment on that? Yeah, I mean, you know, the, these what we saw reflected back in the COVID kind of problems were the likes of, you know, um, port states or, or whatever, really perhaps either not, not reacting in the way that we would have hoped that they would. So all of a sudden seafarers, despite the fact that they were delivering the cargoes that were keeping society ticking along and running they weren't reflected in the rewards that came with that and then you know there's this constant litany of these terrible criminalization cases there's one going on currently in Nigeria you know where seafarers once again are caught up in the crosshairs of problems you know seafarers are the solution to so much of what we rely on in the world today but it is so rarely reflected in the way that they're actually treated recognized and rewarded and that's the that's a worrying gap that seems to be growing ever more okay um and would anybody else like to comment on that it's the whole key worker status, um, even though it, it has been it has been mentioned so many times in other forums, uh, but there are still so many flag states who have not properly implemented it. And and I fully agree with with Naveen. It's it's uh, it is an issue. But as, as long as the flag states are not putting all these measures in place and are properly recognizing the value of seafarers, then it will remain an issue. Okay, and then we have one question here um, about the, have we looked into the difference in the levels of ha happiness across different nationalities? 
So has there been any, um, are there any insights there, Stephen, from your perspective on the happiness index? Yeah, I mean, we, we do look at that. And that's one of the issues that's kind of, you know, in the demographic stuff across the reports. Um, I think it's one of the more problematic ones because, you know, there are cultural differences, there are language differences. It's sometimes a little bit hard, you know, to, to fully extrapolate the data out when you've asked someone from, you know, that part of the world whether they feel happy versus someone else. So I, I think it's one of the more kind of problematic issues to address within the data that we have, but we do ask it. Um, and for what it's worth, it tends to be that seafarers from Southeast Asia um, in the main tend to be a little bit more optimistic and happier about their lot. Okay. All right. Thanks for that. Just, um, we've had a little bit of advice through maybe. So um, going back to the points that we were making about mixed gender crew, um, we've had a little note here to look look at Brazil and what Brazil are doing, and they're seeming to have some success in that area. So just a good one to put out there. If I could just add there, um, I was actually out in Brazil a few years ago uh, working for the Nautical Institute, and I was invited along. So we'd been accrediting a college. We did the thing, and they said, oh, would you present at the cadet um, kind of, you know, awards thing? So, yeah, yeah, no problem at all. Pushed me through a side door came out onto a huge stage in an auditorium with something like about 5,000 cadets. And, and there were very mixed gender races, everything going on, but it was a bit bewildering seeing all those faces all smiling and we did the awards, but it was, I, I think, yeah, Brazil is certainly indicative of, of a place that is seemingly getting the message across positively about seafaring. Okay, something then we should probably learn from, yeah. from them. OK, so um, now it's time to get out your crystal ball and have a little look into the future. Um, and firstly to Tom, um, what do you think seafaring will look like in another 10 years time? Um, it's a good question. I think ultimately seafaring, I, how, I, what will it like in 10 years time will entirely depend on the kind of actions that were taken today. So as an industry, uh, we've known that welfare conditions have not been great. However, this has often been from subjective sources or more extreme cases being highlighted in a more public forum. I do feel though that the data that I've shown, uh, as well as the, the comments that have been raised by the other panelists today, uh, puts these concerns into a more objective context, which makes it much harder to ignore the problem. And from this, action can and must be taken. As an example, why would you not install a free to access and limited Wi-Fi for crew on board a vessel when you know there is a potential increase to the risk of the asset by not doing so. And I hope that it will be different. And I do believe that data like this is a step in the right path down this route. Okay, thanks, Tom. Um, Eve? My crystal ball is very foggy soon. <laughs> um, I, I would agree with, with what Tom is saying. Um, a lot will depend on what, what we are doing. There will be a lot more automation down the road. Um, I'm very interested in, in the, the review that STCW is going to go through next year. I think that will be hugely important, though I'm not holding my breath uh, for what for an increase in standards. I, I hope that the IMO will increase the standards. So it'll be there. We will need seafarers. We will need more of them. Um, and I hope that it'll, it'll, it'll be a, a better situation than now. OK, thank you. Uh, Stephen? Yeah, I mean, I guess the shipping ships themselves will have to look, feel, smell, and sound different. You know, we're going to be using different fuels and all, all the rest of it. So there's going to be those kind of fundamental changes that affect the running and construction. Um, I think the vessels that kind of do things will probably remain remarkably the same. So, you know, the cable ships, the dredges, the work boats, the, whatever, they, you know, where they're kind of the function drives the form will probably be remarkably similar. And I think the requirement for seafarers will remain because there's so many kind of, you know, elements that rely on people. But I think the cargo market will change and evolve quite what the kind of, you know, energy mix will look like, I don't know. Um, but I think that will drive a, a real kind of 
reimagining, if you like, of what seafaring is because shipping itself will change. Um, I was playing around with uh, an AI chat bot yesterday. It was writing some things for me. And I, I thought I'd ask it some questions. And I asked the chat bot whether autonomous ships would be the end of seafarers. And the AI said that it wouldn't. We would still need seafarers <laughs> into the future. So that's the computer talking. The AI knows. <laughs> <laughs> OK, thank you for that. And so very last question. Um, so given all your experience and what you know to date, um, would you still go to sea today? Um, and that one to Tom, as our most recent seafarer. <laughs> so uh, that is an excellent question. But I think being brutally honest, I wouldn't know. Um, in the current industry, it is simply too much of a gamble as to what kind of ship I might end up working on. Will it have Wi-Fi? Will that Wi-Fi be free to access and limited? Or will I need to take out a second mortgage to cover the cost of communicating with my family and friends? Will it have good quality food? Will that food be regularly replenished? Will a healthy and a varied diet be available? Will there be appropriate social areas on board with sufficient and varied recreational facilities? <clears throat> For example, will a rec room also be a smoking room or can I, I, I relax somewhere and not worry about being covered in smoke? Will I have time to actually use these facilities? Ultimately, one of the reasons I, I decided to come ashore was because of all of these questions were answered as a no. The positives that I mentioned earlier on in my first a, 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 a answer to the first question were far outweighed by the negatives. However, we know this is an issue and we're starting to get a much better idea of how much this may impact the condition and as such, risk of the vessel. I think it is vital that we listen to this and take action to ensure that current as well as the next generation of seafarers do not have to live through the same issues. Okay, thanks, Tom. Um, Eve? If I would go back to sea today um, as a passenger on a cruise ship, <laughs> um, sure. I'm, it's easy for me. My tickets expired long time ago, so I don't need to. But joking aside, I, I, I can understand Tom's um, comments on this, but I, I think seafaring is still a, a, a great job. I think there is it's a big future. It's it's great experience that you have. Would I personally go back? I think it's a different lifestyle on board of ships now. It, it has different ways of doing things that are different from what I would expect. Um, so personally, maybe I wouldn't. Um, but that doesn't make a difference. That doesn't make it less desirable as a as a job. I think it is a it's a great job to do. Yeah. Okay. Thanks for that. And bring us home, Stephen. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the honest answer is no. But it's not because of what seafaring is today. It's the fact that I wouldn't go to sea today because I went yesterday, and because it gave me such an amazing, rewarding career that's moved me forward. So, you know, it's it's very difficult, you know, we've perhaps become too lazy, soft and, and demanding to, to consider going on the ship today, but it shaped me, it challenged me, it vexed me, it annoyed me, but it gave me everything that I've got now. And I think, you know, that's the thing. And I think for young people considering the sea, it is a challenge. It's a difficult thing to do, you know, for all the reasons we've discussed. But I'll tell you what, there's very few better options that will set you up for the rest of your life with experiences that you'll be telling people when you're as old as us, you know, they'll stick with you for a long, long time. And it gives you, you know, broad horizons, literally and figuratively. And I think, you know, there are still so many wonderful things to be gained. And you don't have to put up with the likes of me on board. <laughs> Okay, thank you for that. Um, so unfortunately, um, we are at the end of our hour, so we'll have to leave it there. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we'll circulate an overview of the questions and answers in the next few days. We, we did get a few more in that we weren't able to get to, so um, we'll make sure that we put them all together and we get those responses out and circulate them to everyone. So I would like to thank the panel for your valuable time and insights. Um, thank you very much. Uh, I'd also like to thank everyone online for attending. Hope it's given you all some understanding or at least uh, made you more questioning as to what life is like at sea and hopefully provided some food for thought on what still needs to be done and how we might be able to help make that happen. 
Um, okay, thank you everyone. Um, take care and we look forward to seeing you soon. Okay, bye-bye. Thank Thanks you. Everyone. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thanks all.